Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome hi. to the second session of our conference. We continue our journey together across uh, borders and time zone from the couch at home. It is truly amazing. I hope this good atmosphere will stay with us after Corona. It is uh, my privilege to chair this and indirectly with ethics, science, the meaning of life, academic study, fascism, Nazism, and racism, historical issues, and food for thought for us in uh, the here and now. It, has, it is uh, my pleasure to call upon the first speaker, <coughs> Dr. Erika <coughs> Silvestri, who will talk about uh, Lebens und Wertes Leben, Roots and Memory <coughs> of the Action. <coughs> 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 Everybody? Everybody has uh, to put on mute because uh, I hear voices. Okay. Mute. Mute. I try to share with you my contacts, my title presentation. I hope you're watching now. And okay, I can start. So uh, first of all, I wanted to say I'm very glad to be here today with you and to have the opportunity to share a bit about my research. I'm working at the moment with uh, Professor Stephanie Schumann-Springoru um, from the Zentrum für Antisemitismus Forschung here in Berlin and with Professor Emanuel Betta from La Sapienza University of Rome. And yeah, as you can see from the title, my research is about the, specifically about the transgenerational memory of Aktion zu Fear, the Nazi euthanasia program, in the theory of the uh, I would like to um, um, let you start from a reflection I had here in Berlin. When I arrived, for the first time, I discovered that the Berlin Memorial for the victim of Action to Fear was built just six years ago. And it was the last one, the last memorial to um, dedicate to a victim we built. Also, if you try to visit a public library here in Berlin, searching for a book about the Nazi crimes, you will find hundreds of books about the Holocaust, but just a few ones about Action to Fear. Why? I try to talk with Germans about that, and I have the feeling that this is a problematic for them to talk specifically about that crime. So I decided to start this research and to investigate in the public debate, which is very young anyway, the German public debate about um, the euthanasia program, and um, also to investigate in the family space, the family memories. I realized a group of um, um, interviews I tried to contact families who had a relative killed in the Action to Fear program and I realized a group of interviews. And from the analysis of this interview, I have seen that there is a kind of mechanism pattern repeatedly itself in every family story. There is, for example, always the presence of family secret, that's the way in which they call it a family secret, something that was hidden in the family, but still every member could feel it somehow. Uh, an active role of the youngest generation who discovered the secret and decided to start uh, research about the victim's relative. And an, uh, how to say, an untapped role of the oldest generation who in every family, in a different way, but try to hide the story of the victims or in some, um, some cases also to destroy, to completely destroy the um, victim story and in, in the end the closure of this traumatic circle how to say that's the kind of pattern I, I analyze in every story you have to consider that t4 families um, for t4 families is really difficult to define borders between the role of victims and the role of perpetrator because in a lot of family both roles were in the same family in the same space and also because they feel themselves part of the same um, German national uh, community. They were 
both victims and perpetrators were Germans. And um, you have also to consider that this crime is felt by those families like the only crime who deeply has been inside the family space. It was not possible for them to point out to others external to the family, for example, the Jews or um, other um, people from other countries, occupied countries, because the victims of that, that crime were husbands or sister, brother, all members of the same family. Um, if you see from this point of view, this situation can read as kind of partial suicide by the German national race community at the time. And it is, in my opinion, also a very unique situation in which the youngest generation of Germans feel to be part not only of the uh, guilty Germany, on the perpetrator side, but at the same time they right to express themselves as, as part of a victim's group. That's very unique. And it's also difficult to compare that transmission, memory transmission inside the family with other cases, similar cases. If you think to the Holocaust family, survivor, transgenerational memory, this is really a different position. And also the analysis has to be different. My research is an ongoing research, so I'm still working on that. I'm still making an interview and I'm still trying to analyze. But I feel that that's the most important uh, point. The, um, the way in which, especially the youngest generation of German feel to be um, in between these two role definitions. I would like on that, to read to you uh, a little, very little extract from one of my interviews with a young generation member who told me. More and more, I also felt that it is my obligation for my uncle to remember him. That's the only thing I can do for him. The Nazi murdered him, my family collaborated, and they made him forgotten, so he didn't exist any longer. I had to go on with the research to bring him back to memory, back to my family, back to life. I left for you my email address. I had a really a very uh, short time, so uh, I cannot say more about research, but if you have some advice, I would be very thankful to you, so please write me. Okay. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank and uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Rebecca Clifford, and uh, she is going to speak about photography, psychology, and child Holocaust survivors in the early post-war years. So, Dr. Rebecca, please. Hi there. I'm, can you hear me? Yes. I'm just trying to start the slideshow. Hold on. Um, Thank you to everybody for organizing this conference, which I think, although it is very strange to be participating in a conference when I can hear my kids downstairs, it's just so nice to see, first of all, lots of new faces and also lots of people who I adore seeing and I just don't get a chance to see very often. And I really hope we'll continue to meet this way after, if and after things go back to normal. So I, um, I just finished a book on child survivors uh, in their post-war lives, and that is coming out in a few months' time, I'm very happy to say. And I'm starting work on a new book, which is on um, a very specific group of child survivors who came to Britain in the early post-war years and a special scheme for co child concentration camp survivors. They're a fascinating group, uh, not only in and of themselves, but because a lot of um, interest was taken in them by uh, British uh, psychoanalysts, and specifically by uh, Anna Freud, who uh, wrote a seminal 1951 paper called An Experiment in Group Upbringing on the post-war experiences of these children. And it's a paper you can still find discussed in pretty much every you know, text, undergraduate textbook on child develop, developmental psychology. So it's really a very important paper. Today I wanna to talk very briefly about uh, photographs of these, this group of young children and to think about how we might use these photographs as sources. Um, photographs of, uh, to use the terminology of the time, of Jewish war orphans 
reflected at one and the same time both hopes for a process of psychological and emotional reconstruction in the aftermath of war, and also fears about children as the carriers of destructive forces, reflecting uh, the instability of, of post-war Jewish communities and more broadly of, of European societies after the war. Now the young group of, the group of young Holocaust survivors who came to Britain um, in the early post-war years, the kind of biggest group of them came in in August 1945, so it's going to be the 75th anniversary very shortly. They were among the most photographed group of war orphans in the immediate post-war period, uh, certainly in Britain. Um, and actually, the, in many ways, you can see from the cover image here, it's kind of the photographs are very unrepresentative in a way because of that group of children who came to Britain after the war. Most were actually teenagers and most were boys. But in the photographs, you see mostly images of, of young, especially of young children and also of, of young girls. Um, although not so much in, in this photograph, I suppose. So I want to argue that these images were designed to send a redemptive message about the potential psychological normalization of Jewish war orphans, uh, and that we can use these images to unpick the shifting ways in which concepts of a, of a normal childhood um, were being reworked after the war with the very direct participation of this group of, um, of child psychoanalysts. And you've made art. Sorry, is someone asking a question? Uh, no, okay, I will continue. Um, I can kind of hear voices in the background. Um, so keeping in mind, of course, that the leading authorities uh, in this nascent field of child psychoanalysis uh, were chiefly working in London at the time. So not just Anna Freud, but also uh, Melanie Klein, Donald Winnicott, uh, John Bowlby, and others, um, as the wonderful work of, of Michal Shapira has illustrated. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about how a broad public might have looked at these photos. I could say a lot more about how it specifically about how British Jewish community might have looked at them, uh, but not in only seven minutes. So I think it's important to see these images, first of all, in context. And part of the context of the time was a fear that war had robbed children, not just Jewish children, the whole generation of European children, of their chances of leading a normal life and understood in normative terms of the time of developing moral constraints and a certain again normative set of healthy childhood emotions. Um, so here's a kind of typical image is actually from the war from Otto Zoff's book They Shall Inherit the Earth of the lost children who are you know both to be pitied and to be feared. Um, you know, this is children as the carriers of destructive forces, forces unleashed by the war that then threaten to continue into the next generation. Now in the British context, uh, viewers' gaze was particularly shaped by the experience of, of Belsen. So keeping in mind that um, it was British troops that liberated Bergen-Belsen in April of 1945. And then for a little brief period, kind of a couple of weeks after that, there was a circulation of very horrific images from Belson in the British press, uh, in print media, and in newsreels. So it's not a surprise to see that these images are often kind of worked through the rubric of Belson. So here you see that these are the children uh, who have come in August 1945 to Britain. They're running out of their schoolhouse, and the heading says they came in agony from Belson to forget. Now, none of these children came from Belson. Most of the children in the photograph actually came from Theresienstadt, which was meaningless to a British public, so it, so it, it's kind of read through this rubric of Belson. But what I want to point your attention to is down in the corner how it, it has a kind of before and after spread, from fear to smiles. Now this sort of before and after genre is one with much older roots in humanitarian aid photography, for example. If you look at um, the images used by humanitarian aid organizations such as Save the Children, going back to the First World War, you'll often see this used in fundraising campaigns to kind of say, well, here's the, you know, here's the child who is, is, is ill or starving or weak, and here's the child restored to health. So that typically the trope would work that way. It would show the physical body of the child returning to a state of, of physical health. What is so fascinating here for me is that the child is physically healthy on both sides. And you can see this trope repeated again and again in press images of this small group of children 
uh, in Britain in the early post-war years. So again, here we've got another one from the same group of children. Um, you've got Erwin, then you've got Fritz, and again, perfectly physically healthy on both sides. The before image here, um, sorry, I should say the after image here, is meant to illustrate not a child's return to physical health, but the return to normal childhood emotions, happy, secure, and with darker emotions under control, and the status as a cowed child victim of Nazism also scrubbed out to a certain degree. Rebecca, you have one minute, please. I am going to finish. Um, I think these images remind us that the process of post-war reconstruction was as much about minds and psyches as it was about buildings and bodies. I also think they suggest a fascinating intersection of different historiographies that are not often seen as overlapping. The historiographies of photography, of childhood and children, of reconstruction, Holocaust memory, psychoanalysis, and humanitarian aid. And I also think they suggest something about the nature of remembering and forgetting the concentration camp experience in the early post-war years, because I know there's many of us here who are really interested in unpicking that idea of silence in the early post-war years. I think here we see the, the, the position the survivor child as one who's both rendered significant by his or her camp experience, and yet ultimately redeemed by the ability to forget it, which of course in the long term proved impossible for many of these children. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. And Stacy Gallin will be our next speaker. Uh, Stacy will talk about the uh, bioethics and the Holocaust. Stacy? Stacy? She's not here? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Put it in slideshow mode, hopefully. You'll succeed. It's here. We see Excellent. you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for having me as part of this wonderful program. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to so many people from all over the world today. As the only example of medically sanctioned genocide in history, the Holocaust provides an invaluable framework for exploring current issues in bioethics medical practice, healthcare policy, and human rights. As we saw during the Holocaust and continue to witness today, a discriminatory hierarchy of humanity supported by political, nationalistic, religious, economic, or other outside forces is dangerous to the foundation of society. The confluence of events that led to the labeling persecution and eventual mass murder of millions of those deemed unfit by intellectual and political leaders alike must be understood not only in the context of history, but also in relation to advances in medical technology that threaten the core principles central to the ethical practice of science, medicine, and public health. While the Holocaust is often viewed from a historical perspective, it is essential to understand the modern ramifications of the ways in which the power of medicine and the promise of scientific progress were abused during the Holocaust to subvert the basic human rights of those deemed inferior in an attempt to improve the future of society. The field of bioethics continues to be plagued with issues that have their roots in the lessons of the Holocaust beginning of life care debates over medical genetics and interventions, end of life matters such as physician assisted suicide and death with dignity provisions, the development of ethical codes and regulations to guide human subject research and human rights abuses in vulnerable populations. Scientific technology has progressed to the point where it can be used to alter the very basis of humanity, which begs the question, just because we can, does that mean we should? We cannot afford to ignore the lessons of the past as we continue to face these challenges in the present and in the future. Without an understanding of the ways in which the power of medicine and the promise of scientific progress were abused during the Holocaust, we are at risk of repeating history. To say that the Holocaust was merely an instance of medicine gone mad 
is to ignore the moral beliefs that allowed those sworn to uphold the Hippocratic tenet of healing to become killers. The significance of fostering a personal and professional ethos that values the protection of human rights and the central principles of bioethics first and foremost cannot be overstated. The goal of the project I will be discussing today is to put together a multimedia academic curriculum that can be used to galvanize the next generation of leaders to action by promoting moral decision making and the primacy of human dignity ahead of scientific progress and political expediency in order to ensure that we reflect on the past to protect the future. This project began well before the global pandemic we are currently facing, but I believe it's more relevant now than ever as discussions about the role of the doctor in caring for the individual versus caring for society, debates about whether or not the value of human life is worth the economic cost of shutting down society, and deliberations about whether or not catastrophe ethics can or should take precedence in times of crisis abound. At the UNESCO Bioethics 13th World Conference on Bioethics, Medical Ethics, and Health Law held in late 2018 in Jerusalem, the Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust of the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics was formally introduced. This department is co-chaired by myself and Dr. Tessa Shalush of Israel, who is here today. Hi, Tessa. This Response to our new department was incredibly positive, and after conversations with some of the international delegates in attendance, specifically Professor Evangelos Protopapadakis, the editor-in-chief of the Canadis Journal of Philosophy, we decided to work on an international publication. Because of the enthusiastic response of all involved, we were able to move quickly. In February 2019, we put out a call for papers for a special issue of the Canadis Journal of Philosophy dedicated to bioethics and the Holocaust. And on December 31st, 2019, Canadis 4.2 Special Issue Bioethics and the Holocaust was published. Professor Ira Bedzo of New York Medical College and I served as the guest editors, and we had an editorial board consisting of 10 individuals from nine countries. We had close to 30 authors from eight countries and several academic disciplines represented as well. In fact, three of these authors have presented or will be presenting their papers today. You will notice them highlighted in yellow and I've also seen that several of our authors are in attendance um, here as well. You can access the full PDF version of this journal for free on the Maimonides Institute's website, www.mimeh. Org. While the academic significance of this publication to the field in and of itself was important, arguably more important was the fact that this special issue served as a collaboration between people of different religious, geographic, and cultural backgrounds who all share a common goal, ensuring that the lessons of the Holocaust are not forgotten. With the idea of remembering the past to protect the future in mind, we formally presented this special issue as part of an International Holocaust Remembrance Day event in Athens on January 28th, 2020. Again, this event was significant not only academically, but culturally as well, for it brought together people from different backgrounds to honor the importance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, while also pledging their commitment to the promotion of Holocaust education for current issues in bioethics and human rights. The success of the special issue on bioethics and the Holocaust, along with the international support we received, paved the way for the acceptance of our book proposal as part of the Springer International Library of Bioethics. Bioethics and the Holocaust, a comprehensive study in how the Holocaust continues to shape the ethics of health and medicine, will be an edited volume of new material that can be used as the primary text for upper level undergraduate, graduate, and healthcare professional courses. It is aimed at an interdisciplinary audience. The book will be approximately 12 to 14 chapters to correspond with the typical number of weeks in a semester. Our hope is to develop related online modules for each chapter so that eventually we will have an entire digital curriculum that can be used internationally. This has become even more important now with the increase in remote and e-learning that we've seen in response to COVID-19. 
the purpose of the special issue of Canatus. Yes, you have one more minute, please. Yep. Got it. Thank you. The purpose of the special issue of Canatus was to garner and measure international interdisciplinary interest. The major difference here is that this text will serve as the foundational primary text and thus will focus on the main aspects of bioethics and the Holocaust. Therefore, the three major areas of focus will be the historical and contemporary context of medicine and the Holocaust, current issues in bioethics, health law, policy, and human rights, and the impact of bioethics and the Holocaust on the future of medicine. The goal for publication of this book is spring, summer 2021. Because we want this text to serve as a primary resource for educators in the field, we are currently soliciting authors to work on certain chapters and we'll be issuing an open call for the remaining chapters within the next month. Mm -hmm. We have secured some funding for the development of corresponding online modules and hope to be able to pilot the use of the entire multimedia curriculum in the fall 2021 semester. I invite all of you here today to contact me if you're interested in this project, um, it, whether that means writing a chapter, teaching the course at your institution, or just hosting a lecture on the topic. I think the pos one of the positive things we've learned from the COVID-19 crisis is that we're stronger together than we are apart. And if we work collaboratively to pool our resources like we're doing here, we can accomplish much more. So thank you so much for your time and thank you to the organizers for putting together this wonderful event. Mariana, tell mute. Okay, thank you very much, Stacy. An important uh, project. And uh, I want to invite uh, Irena, Irena Nastesa Mati, Mati, and uh, she is going uh, to speak about the uh, transnational uh, fascist networks and the uh, far right propaganda academic funding schemes for Eastern Europe during the Nazi regime. Please, Irena. Irena, you have, you have to open. Irena, we don't hear you. Irena. And now you hear me? Now we, now we hear you, yes. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Ah, perfect. Excellent. Then it's okay. Good, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to speak today about the transnational fascist networks and fire right propaganda, academic funding schemes for Eastern Europe during the Nazi regime. This is actually an extension of uh, uh, some case studies that I did in my uh, PhD, which uh, it was about Romanian students in Nazi Germany and how uh, this uh, affected their, uh, um, their future development, ideological development, their implication into far right organizations and, uh, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, so seven minutes is a very short time for presenting uh, a, a huge uh, topic. So I'm going to give uh, some, um, just some uh, hints about uh, what this is about. And uh, everybody who is interested can write me and I already published but some articles on this in English, but I can uh, give them uh, 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 to, to the interested, interested people. So first of all, I want to, uh, to say that, uh, so um, academic exchanges and student exchanges and foreign students were important for Nazi Germany, uh, especially, um, uh, especially, how? Oh. Um, so what in, uh, especially when um, in their propaganda uh, activities can you see my powerpoint now no, no you have to do uh, again share screen okay i'm very sorry it just talked by itself now it's okay now it's okay good uh, so uh, uh, the foreign students were important for uh, the nazi uh, authorities and uh, uh, they uh, invested a lot in foreign uh, uh, students and uh, financing foreign academics in order to uh, organize and finance transnational networks of far right and which was kind of bi-dimensional and also in order to implement their propaganda especially in southeastern uh, Europe after uh, 1933. Uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, the politics towards the foreign students was not similar with the one before 1933. That means the uh, selection of the foreign students was, was made uh, based on uh, other criteria than before. Of course, the Jewish students were not welcome. The female students were not uh, um, were, not, were not encouraged uh, uh, anymore to to uh, come to study in the Third Reich. Uh, and uh, of course, the selection was also preferential in terms of uh, uh, the students who were welcome to Nazi Germany had to be uh, sympathizers of Nazi Germany or members of far right organizations in their own uh, uh, countries. <clears throat> so that was the politics of selection of the foreign students. And there was also a politics of uh, instrumentalization of the foreign students. And here, for example, is a big quotation from, um, um, in 1933, uh, the foreign students were encouraged to, uh, to write an open letter to the whole world in which they were expressing how wonderful there was in uh, Nazi Germany actually, and there was peace and there was uh, a freedom of, uh, of uh, uh, academic freedom and, uh, and so on. This is only just an example that I'm uh, sharing with you here, but there were others, uh, other uh, um, things that they were, uh, uh, encouraged to do, for example, to send uh, letters to their home universities or to their families at home expressing exactly the, uh, this. Uh, now, uh, also uh, regarding uh, the relationship with uh, <coughs> Romania, because this is a case study that, that, of course, I know better and I study better, but uh, it's, it's the same for the Southeastern Europe in general. First, Nazi Germany organized um, semi-official academic exchanges with uh, Romania since its relationship with the Romanian state was not that good up to 35, 36. This summer of uh, semi-official summer schools is very interesting that they were organized by uh, <clears throat> different organizations in Germany, Nazi Germany, like for example, DAD with uh, far-right organizations, student organizations in Romania, like uh, uh, with the National Union of Christian Students or with the Legionary Union. And here are also some quotations from, uh, so the documentation is very scarce, but still I could find in the Romanian uh, archives of the Ministry of Education, these reports about some of these summer schools in which it is very clear that the students who were chosen to go to Germany or uh, to organize the summer schools which took place in Romania were members of the Iron Guard or at least sympathizers of Nazi Germany. <coughs> Only later, after 35, 36, uh, the, German, uh, the Nazi Germany decided that uh, actually these semi-official uh, summer schools and uh, uh, academic exchanges don't function as well as they would like to uh, for their propaganda purposes. So they developed a much bigger strategy with much more finances in order to really attract youth from, from uh, this part of Europe, specifically in my case Romania, uh, to uh, to uh, become sympathizers uh, of the Nazi Germany and to become uh, transmitters of the far right. And uh, these uh, fellowship schemes were um, the, mo the, the most important were the DAD, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Fellowships, and the Mitteleuropäische Wirtschaftstag. The third one, Mitteleuropäische Wirtschaftstag, for example, was uh, designed specifically for Southeastern Europe it had to function for three years, but it had a success. So they were developed for two additional years between 36 and 1940, and only the war managed to stop this, uh, this financing. And uh, it's also, it's interesting that they were designed specifically for ethnics from that specific countries, country. For example, only ethnic Romanians could receive such a fellowship, not ethnic Germans from Romania or ethnic Hungarians and so on. Uh, and here also an interesting quotation about the selection of these uh, fellows for the Mitteleuropäische Wirtschaftstag. They had to write an uh, intention letter. Uh, and uh, there it is very clear in this uh, 
this is a letter that I found uh, by accident because these documents from these foundations, uh, they are not uh, available. In general, they are not available. Second, the day at their headquarters was bombed in 1942, so anyway, they were destroyed. Uh, so it was uh, just uh, by mistake, so to say, that I found some uh, relevant documentation in this direction. And for example, you can see from these letters of the students that when they are asking for a fellowship, they are uh, they are uh, putting a, a, an accent on the fact that they are involved in the far right and uh, in the legionary movement. Not they are not talking too much about their profession or their academic achievements, but of their political interests. Irena, you have one minute, please. Okay, so and uh, so, uh, uh, then uh, I, I had more, uh, uh, much more uh, examples of such uh, uh, um, uh, uh, examples of uh, these strategies of the Nazis that the Nazis used in order to select the foreign students based on their political uh, attitudes and then how they were instrumentalized. And here I have some interesting quotation, I think, uh, what the Humboldt Fellows actually had to declare in order to be able to receive, like for example, a pro prolonging of their uh, fellowship. And uh, I had some interesting, very interesting case studies from Romanian Humboldt Fellows, which received the fellowship. Some of them, uh, most of them, it is very uh, obvious from these reports that I accidentally found that uh, they had to be politically involved and if they were not politically involved, they wouldn't receive a continuation of the fellowship uh, first. And then, uh, of course, there is the issue of how this, um, uh, this uh, fellowships impacted the students. And actually, if you do an analysis of how uh, was the impact of this fellowship, you can see that uh, these uh, students, not only that they became involved in uh, far-right politics or in the legionary movement, uh, not only that maybe they changed their mind about democracy and uh, uh, became uh, like, uh, national socialists, uh, but also many of them uh, for a, a period of time, uh, they, they had specific functions. They occupied later on specific functions in the Romanian academia, uh, in uh, the bureaucratic regime of uh, Antonescu, for example. Some of them also, they, many of them were lecturers, uh, Romanian lecturers in other countries, in foreign countries. So uh, they, uh, they were uh, in the position of spreading these uh, attitudes and so on. And of course, it was always the way they did their job, which was also uh, influenced by, by their studies in Nazi Germany. For example, uh, uh, the philosophers who did national philosophy, for example, were sociologists. Uh, so there are many, many types of uh, uh, this kind of examples. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And our uh, last speaker for this session is uh, Josephine Wagner from the Mandel Center, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And uh, Josephine will talk about education for uh, inferiority, uh, race hygienic discourses in uh, special needs education. So, uh, Josephine, please. Is, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So to... Okay, um, thank you very much. I would like to uh, say, first of all, um, uh, thank you to the team of uh, this extraordinary conference, Woni Mikkel Arieli, Daniela Ozalski Stern, and Boas Cohen for giving me the um, possibility to present my work here. I also want to thank uh, the Mandel Center of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for the possibility of deepening my research, as well as um, Juliet Golden, who's been um, an incredible professional support uh, to me and who's guided me throughout this journey. Um, by 1933, the NSLB, the National Socialist Teacher Alliance, organized 97% of all teachers in Nazi Germany. It had become the governing body of all edu educators whose leadership was tightly interwoven with the Nazi party elite. Uh, this you can see, for example, here, this um, election campaign poster 
uh, Hans Schem, who was uh, the founder of the NSLB in 1929 um, until 1935, uh, can be seen in the second, um, uh, in the bottom row, second to the left. Um, the NSLB was organized in seven chapters in accordance with uh, different branches of uh, formal education. Chapter five was um, the Fachschaft Five Sonderschulen, special schools. And it was an entirely new sub-organization that, uh, that combined special educators um, from schools for the hearing impaired, the blind, um, the physically impaired, and um, help school students. Um, although students of help schools uh, or special schools were considered undesirable in Nazi jargon because they did not comply with the able-bodied Aryan um, prototype, help school students were categorized as feeble-minded, and feeble-mindedness was considered particularly detrimental to the German gene pool as it conflated all kinds of deficits, malnutrition, poverty, learning delay, immoral behavior, promiscuity, and also um, a liability to criminal behavior. Um, congenital feeble-mindedness was the first criterion for sterilization that was fixed in the law for the prevention of hereditary ill offspring um, that was released in July 1933. And special educators were involved in drafting this law and achieved that their profession advanced from a pedagogical splinter branch to the ranks of an enabler discipline that was needed for the selection process. Um, chapter five uh, also published uh, its own journal called Die Deutsche Sonderschule, the German um, special school, in which Paul Ruckau, uh, he himself was a teacher of deaf mute students and the head of the chapter at the time summarized on, I'm sorry that you are not able to see all of this, but um, we have the special, uh, we the special school teachers have an incredibly heavy responsibility. We must make sure that the growing power of the German people, the Volkskraft, is not weakened through enemies of the nation and racially harmful over humanity. For the treatment of the disabled but still useful students, we must um, care adequately and responsibly to eradicate the totally unworthy as a necessity to maintain the nation. Um, therefore, uh, we um, carry the heavy responsibility, or this is the heavy responsibility of all special school teachers towards the fatherland. Now, um, drawing on this quote, we must understand that special schools were places of pre-selection for sterilization and later on for referral to the Kinderfachabteilung, the child, children's care wards where child euthanasia programs were carried out. Elvira Hempel, um, a child survivor who escaped selection at the gas chamber remembers that she was diagnosed as feeble-minded, deviant, psychopathic and bildungsunfähig uneducable. Whoever was not able to show significant progress in help schools was considered uneducable and referred to the local care institutions, which meant direct access to the implementers of the killing programs to their victims. Now turning towards the uh, pedagogical material, I, I want to quote Carl Torno, who wrote the teacher education man manual for um, special educators called Heritage and Fate. Um, uh, throughout the book, uh, he lays out that special educators must teach their students their own unworthiness, remind them of how their disabilities and dysfunctions impairs them and kind of keeps, you know, is compared to the able-bodied um, useful parts of society. And so the goal of the educator, he points out, is um, to elicit complicity from special school students for their own sterilization. And, um, and in this quote that I'm showing you here, he's referring to the fact that once judgment is passed that sterilization is necessary, it is the duty of the hereditary sick to be complicit with this verdict and it's a sign of commitment to the German people that they are complicit in this measure out of their own free will. Uh, Carl Torno and others published a textbook for help school students 
that I unearthed in the rare books collection of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, the book is called Fibel for Hilfsschulen. It's like it's a reading book for high school students. And um, it's used to teach reading, but it actually has very strong race hygienic undertones that are very strongly audible. The book depicts um, the book depicts boys in uniforms belonging to the Hitler Youth, and they are associated with very with positive character traits. For example, you see the boy in the middle carrying apples. Um, you see the boys down below chasing away a mouse with a broomstick and kind of protecting sister and brother. You see, um, you see a, a boy on the phone being, you know, engaged in some kind of useful activity. You see the children um, that are collecting money for the Winter Hilfswerk, a charity organization, and then you can see how also they are in the left-hand corner, um, yeah. Hitler Youth boys, you know, playing an instrument, understanding military or you know, teaching each other something. They're all cleanly dressed, neatly dressed, and kind of towards uh, goal-oriented. Goal now, I would like you to please pay attention to the large picture in the right-hand corner. And there's a boy there that you can see in a blue t-shirt, and he's pointing at the, at the marching boys. And um, throughout the book, this boy appears, and he's always um, in positions of, um, you know, either in trouble, as you can see below, a policeman brings him back home because he lost his way. He, uh, he's picked um, plums, and he runs away with them to eat them by himself. Uh, you see that he's chasing a girl. He's um, uh, playing in a, in a rain puddle. And of central importance is the picture in the middle um, where you can see him in direct juxtaposition where with a, with a brown shirt boy who might be too young to be a part of the Hitler Youth yet, but who has a very specific um, body language. And um, you can, can you see, one please, thank you, of course, thank you. You can see that um, whereas the boy on the right has a goal, he's dressed um, and focused. The boy on the left is only wearing one sock. His body language is shy and intimidated and he's looking towards this other child, you know, um, minding you know, his own business. And you can see in the quote, Uwe wakes up, he collects his things, he washes himself, he searches for his school bag and heads to school. Günther does not wash himself, he does not read, he does not draw. He does not calculate, he does not listen, and he does not pay attention. That is not right. We should understand that help school children um, most likely identified with the boy in the blue shirt as they oftentimes came from very impoverished homes and lacked certain skills and behavioral demonstrations that cast them as feeble-minded. And I would say that this book is very much in line with a lesson in unworthiness and a preparation for voluntary sterilization which uh, was a process that already was initiated during primary, the primary years of education. The first sterilization victims were 10 years old. Um, Dagmar Henze reminds us that 50% to two thirds of the help school population was sterilized. And um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I want to close with these insights. Thank you. So we thank you very much. And now we are going to see the chat with the question. Daniela, you want to... Daniela? Just a second. Uh, Josie? Oh, great. Daniela, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Thank you, all of you. We have a question from Jay uh, to Erica. Since there were German Jewish victims of Aktion T4, if there are subsequent generations related to the victim, do they see the victim as a victim of T4 or of the Shoah? Okay. And so in the greatest part of my interview, they would not define their family as victim of the Shoah. I think um, that in this answer from them, it has a big role that they feel themselves 
uh, still as part of the German, the guilty German, so as German. So they would not uh, let, um, they would not def um, define into the Shoah group because they still feel guilty. And if you think about the Karl um, Jasper definition of German guilt, this is still pretty um, fresh, also in the youngest generation, at least in the T4 families. That's what I have from my interview. So they would um, define uh, as a, um, another kind of victims, but not completely as short victims. Okay. 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 So the second question is from uh, Karen Remler. Uh, Erica and uh, for the other pan panelists also, in what way are you considering feeling of shame uh, that may influence choices about uh, what to reveal or not to reveal as uh, pertains to uh, the experiences, memories and the histories of those affected by T4 and ongoing aftermaths? So we'll start with Erica and then maybe the others will also. Okay, so um, from my, from the analysis of my interview, for sure, the shame has an important role in the oldest generation uh, interviews, for sure, because they still feel the responsibility to collaborate, at least to collaborate with this killing system, maybe not helping so much their relative, uh, but the an interesting thing, in the interesting position is, uh, for the youngest generation, because they um, are really strongly, they really strongly need to present themselves themselves as the opposite of their family. So they completely not feel the shame, but they uh, feel themselves to be kind of partisan. How to say? Um, for example, there was one person telling me. My family um, collaborated, so my family was a Nazi family, but I discovered that secret and I reconstruct the story. So I'm the opposite of a Nazi. So we are in between, in the same family, in these two feelings, the shame of the older generation and the pride, let, let me call like that, the pride of the youngest generation that are really the only um, group of German who dare to feel a kind of pride. Is there anyone else from the panelists that would like to, re to reply also? Josie, please. Thank you. Yeah, I could, um, I would like to underline what Erika just mentioned. And I think that shame was in many times um, families whose children were then taken into care institutions those were families that were strongly impoverished. There were sometimes 15 children in these families. And that one child that was mentally maybe delayed or that had a physical um, um, impairment, the family could not take care of this child and gave the child oftentimes to local care institutions in the goodwill that they would maybe have a better life or receive kind of healing therapeutic measures that would improve their lives. And so being faced many years later with the truth, if investigation actually in the, um, the diagnosis and in the death certificate, certificate did take place, that was, I think, in many families also being in touch with their own guilt and their own complicity, actually, in the treatment of their children. And I think that also looking at memorializations of um, T4, uh, murder of the disabled or murder of... Um, to the children, disabled children, we have this debate of whether um, the full names should be given of the victims or not in order to protect the family's identities. Because stigmatization around disability is something that I think has not stopped and has not been really consolidated and confronted in the extent that, um, that it is necessary because it is nowadays still a huge I mean, a huge topic of how much we should influence um, we should influence the gene stock and how much uh, prenatal observations are allowed. So we we can see that there is actually a lot of these debates that carry on, and that we can actually emphasize with uh, with I think notions of shame around disability. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, there's another question for Erica from Jackie. Can you tell us anything of the relation of family transmitted memory of the Action T4 victims and public commemoration, such as the clay status made to commemorate victims uh, at Grafenek and uh, where visitors adopt them and take them home? Okay, so I would say um, the largest part of my interview uh, does not have a public a relation with the public commemoration. They prefer to have a private family comm commemoration, but um, it still has some difficulty to um, find to, to feel themselves part of a group. As I told you before, it is um, a big issue still in Germany because there is still not a really public debate, in my opinion, about the fear. Um, I, uh, I have given you the example of the Berlin Memorial, that is really the last one. So I would say the greatest part of them um, still prefer a kind of private uh, also relation, how to say, the, um, family association that um, does not feel really uh, represented in a public debate. But um, yeah, it's very difficult to put uh, all in a very short answer. So let's just answer like that for the moment. I don't want to open a very big dialogue about that. Thank you, Erica. So we have a comment to uh, Rebecca from Boaz. Uh, and I thought that there are related questions, so I'll try to, to have it all uh, rubbed out. So to Rebecca, children to be feared was uh, a general phenomenon, uh, post-war uh, generally about uh, war children in Europe. But I have the impression, Boaz, of course, uh, that uh, in uh, Jewish survivors' communities and age ag ag agencies, uh, children were put on uh, a pedestal and as uh, heroes. Uh, and just a second, I'll, uh, I'll just jump to uh, uh, Madeine's uh, um, related to uh, Boa's uh, statement. And she's saying at least from children, child survivors uh, that uh, were under the care of, uh, so, sorry, Lena uh, Kochler Silberman, Silberman, sorry. <laughs> who do not forget uh, their traumatic past, but wait, I'm trying to scroll it without losing your... Um, but found a way to go beyond this trauma. Thank you, Daniela. So, Rebecca, can you uh, address the, those comments? Actually, I, I, I carefully took notes on all the questions because they were such fab questions. And I can see them all going together because there was also a question, um, from Atina and one from Janine and all, kind of similar. Um, if I had another seven minutes, I would have talked to you about the very different images that I used for a specifically Jewish audience, because the images I showed you were for a broad a British audience. Um, so Boaz is, is talking about the images used um, by Jewish communities and also by aid organizations. Yes, they are very different. And actually, if I had I had a chance to show you some of those images, I think for this very specific group of, and this is a small group of child survivors, there's never more than 30 children who pass through this particular orphanage. So um, if we looked at how images of those particular children are used for uh, Jewish community newspapers, for example, we see a very different side of those children. One that really emphasizes the children returning, not not just to kind of happiness, but to actually to very middle class activities. So there's a really interesting class issue there, but it would take quite a while to talk about that. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, it's also very British to have that class worn so, so, so very much on the sleeve. Um, now, uh, Janine asked a question that I just loved. Um, uh, she asked, Do you, did you notice any ambiguous images or moments in which the child or children seek to subvert the intention of the photographer or the narrative of redemption? I love that because uh, it, in the book that I've just finished, I've tried really hard to look for all sorts of moments in which children 
subvert what adults want for them. And so it would be so fabulous to see that uh, in this particular collection of photos. I think it was less obvious, but I'm, I do not want to point the screen down so you can see the floor of my home office because it is covered in photographs right now. But quickly I went and I looked for some photos that might illustrate that. I don't think you're going to be able to see this image though. It's an image, uh, it's in the Holocaust Memorial Museum collection. It's from uh, one of the DP camps. I think it might be an UNRWA image. I actually can't remember. But what I loved about it is that there's the, you know, the aid worker and then look at the look on the boy's face, right? Like it's so, you can just see this aid worker smiling at the camera and everything about this boy looking at her with, with disgust tries to kind of subvert what's going on. And so, yes, I think you can look for, if you hunt around carefully, children, you know, projecting their own emotions onto what was clearly a very adult agenda in, in photography. Um, and as for the question about um, not forgetting the traumatic past, um, of course, you know, if you go beyond photography, you get into a lot of complexities. In a way, photography is very simplistic in, in the way it tries to project an image of putting, right, coming from Belson to forget. Um, the text that often surrounds those images that I showed you in the newspapers is much more complex and talks, uses a psychoanalytic language to talk about kind of working through the past and then setting it aside. And Atina asked um, if, if I would see differences if I looked outside of Britain, basically, or looked outside the world of the influence of uh, psychoanalysts in this, in this time. And the answer is yes, absolutely. In fact, I do think there's probably something quite distinctly British about the images that I showed you. Although you would see a similar sort of before and after thing if you looked at American newspapers at the time, you can see them some similar images in the New York Times. But in terms of the influence of psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic readings, um, I think there's probably something here that's very particular to Britain at a moment when you must remember you had John Bowlby on the BBC every Saturday or Sunday. This is a moment of a lot of influence of, of child um, psychoanalysts in Britain. Okay, we have a question for, for Stacy, and good luck answering it because it's a political question. And I realize it is from uh, Diana. I realize this is a politically tricky question, but I wonder where our bioethics are today, at least in the US. As many political leaders imply or say outright that sacrifice of a part of the population, like the old, the ill minorities, will be accepted as a price of economic health. This feels frighteningly familiar. The voices of bioethics and historians would be so welcome as we confront um, the acceptance of the idea of life unworthy of life. Uh, thank you for this question, because I think it's really important. Um, yes, it's a difficult question for sure, but I think it's really important. Um, it's actually something I have been writing about recently. Um, and on Yom HaShoah, I published an op-ed. Um, not everyone loved it because it's political, um, but I think it's important. And I think if we don't use the lessons of the Holocaust to talk about what's happening right now, um, then we're missing an opportunity. So um, there's a famous quote by Robert Proctor from the book Racial Hygiene Medicine Under the Nazis that says, in times of war or economic crisis, things can happen that otherwise in times of peace or economic stability would never be tolerated. So. Um, I think that's a really important quote. Okay, first of all, obviously, we're not, it's not the same thing. Whenever you talk about, you know, what's happening in the current context, it's not the same as what happened. It's not exactly the same. Motivations are different. Um, all of that needs to be acknowledged. But right now, we are definitely in a unique situation, um, and we are facing an economic crisis. So I live in New Jersey, not far from New York. So in the United States, this is the epicenter of what's happening. And you do hear people talking about things that are frighteningly similar um, to, you know, conversations that were, that were had um, before. And, you know, 
I'm looking at, at some of these things and, and I'm reading about states that we have here in the US and having the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Health and Human Services having to issue bulletins because we have states using intellectual disabilities as criteria for allocation of resources. That is very troubling, right? So I feel like we need to be having these conversations um, because we need to be learning from the past in order to make sure that we're not repeating things that are happening right now. The other thing um, that I think is really important is, um, this is something that was just published um, by the Hastings Center, which here in the US, you know, the Hastings Center is a very uh, well-respected um, center for ethics. And they said, uh, quote, an effective response to COVID-19 acknowledges the tension between the patient-focused duty of care familiar to clinicians and new or urgent public health duties to the community and the healthcare workforce. So when you're talking about kind of ethics and what I was saying a little bit um, at the beginning of my presentation was, it's a mistake to think that doctors in Nazi Germany had no system of ethics. That, that's not true. They did, but their system of ethics, they had a responsibility to the Volk to strengthen the German nation. And so now we're in a situation where we've had this traditional doctor patient relationship at the forefront of medicine, but all of a sudden doctors are being asked you to prioritize the health of the nation as well. How do you do that in an ethical way? Um, and so we do, we need to return to some of these concepts of what are the core ethical foundations. Um, and making sure that we are, are you know, providing that type of education is really important because things happen sometimes, these outside forces that we can't control. And if we're not providing this strong ethics education for these healthcare providers and these public health advocates, then um, you know, we're leaving them without that guidance. And that it can be troubling. So um, that's a great question. Um, and I, I do think that it's really important for bioethicists and historians and people to be speaking out, even if um, it can be controversial. Thank you so much, Uh I'll, So I'll, I'll uh, refer to Irena. So we have two uh, questions, one from Karen Ramler and the, the other from uh, Andrea Pitot. Uh, so, uh, have the foundations themselves ex examined their uh, um, uh, complicity uh, uh, in the in instrumentalization that you have outlined? And the second question is, uh, if you have followed the professional life of the former fellows, can you comment on how did they uh, fit in communist Romania or not? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, well, the, foundation, the foundations, th this is very interesting. Uh, there is not much documentation about what, uh, what uh, I wrote, although there are some uh, articles, uh, especially lately, like in the past uh, six, seven years, about, for example, the Nazi uh, Writers' Union, other uh, female organizations, and how they try to do propaganda in uh, Southeastern Europe. It's very interesting, this. Uh, there is one book about, uh, from uh, Professor Impekovan from Bonn, which uh, wrote about uh, the Humboldt fellowships between 1925 and 1945, which is interesting because he also noticed this, because he found the same reports that I found in the Politisches Archive. Uh, this is a, a 2015 uh, book, but it's more like general, but it's, uh, it, it deals with that. What is interesting in the case of this specific foundation, which is the only one who wrote uh, more intensive about its own activity, it's that uh, they are, uh, they consider that they are, um, they were, um, they were dissolved and they were um, refounded in 1953. And they consider that they, the actual foundation started in 1953 and their official history starts in 1953. But actually what is very interesting is that uh, it started with welcoming former fellows Okay, some of them prior uh, of 1933, but some of them even from the 40s. Uh, so uh, this is how they started. They invited former four, uh, fellows in order to, to relaunch themselves. And uh, from what I've noticed, uh, the networks that they used, at least in the case of Romania or other 
Central East, Euro Eastern European uh, uh, Europe uh, were somehow connected. So it may, it were not, there were not far right networks, but there were like, for example, disciples of a former fellow from the interwar period and so on. So th this connection is very interesting, but it wasn't uh, dealt with before. I've noticed in the case of the Romanian fellows, for example. And this also uh, has a connection with the, uh, the second question about how they, fit into, uh, how they fit into the communist Romania. This is very interesting also. Like uh, the Romanian fellows, the Romanian students in general in Nazi Germany, many of them remain in Germany because after the legionary mo uh, movement was kicked out from the governance by the Antonescu's regime, they were hunted down. So if they were abroad, uh, they, they remained abroad or they tried to flee. Um, uh, they didn't, it was not so easy for them to, to retain their professional positions during Antonescu's regime because there was this conflict between the legionary movement and uh, the, uh, Antonescu. Some of them did because not all of them were legionaries, of course. And I have also some examples, but I think I don't have enough uh, time. Some of the these fellows and some of the, the for, former foreign students in Nazi Germany went into prison in communist Romania in the 50s. Um, many of them because they did propaganda for the far right and so on. What is also very interesting is how they were recuperated, many of them after 1965. When Ceausescu came to power, there was this opening of the Romania's communist regime and it was this national, um, national communist regime. So, uh, for example, the former uh, ideologists of the, some former ideologists of the Iron Guard or some nationalist philosophers or some nationalist uh, poets, writers, were very well regarded by the new nationalist Ceausescu's uh, regime. So they started to receive uh, uh, positions in, uh, in the Romanian Academy to be allowed to, to uh, publish again, so they were somehow recuperated. And uh, also, as I noticed, some of the disciples of this <laughs> received uh, uh, even the right to go to travel to, <laughs> even to West Germany to study there. So uh, this connection is uh, tricky. I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm in the beginning of uh, seeing how it went further with all these uh, destinies. And there was also another question about if they, these people had a more active role than just being propaganda for, for the, well, first of all, they were intellectuals. So this is what they did mostly, it was about uh, uh, propaganda. But yes, I have specific uh, examples of people who had positions, like for example, Golopensia who was uh, uh, the director of the Statistic Institute during Antonescu's regime, or many of uh, these uh, students were uh, employed later at the propaganda institution called the Romanian Institute in Berlin in the 1940s, for example. Or they, they, they became employed in the Romanian legation in Berlin. So they did have positions, the cultural position mostly, or diplomatic positions, not economic or doctors or I don't know. But uh, still, uh, uh, they, they did uh, this. Uh, the only problem was that after, again, mentioning that Antonescu and the legendary movement didn't get along anymore, then they had a more difficult situation during that, that period. So I, I hope it was clear because I tried to be very short. Okay, thank you. And we, we have three we questions. Jumped at Erkel. We jumped at Erkel, uh, or, 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 uh, And no, I want to ask Josephine a few questions, okay? So uh, we have a, a question, I don't know from who, what do we know about the teachers at these schools? What can you say about the extent to which teachers at help schools supported the socialization of children into feelings of inferiority? Did you encounter any accounts of resistance on the part of teachers to this message? And from Ken Price, nice to see you again. The, this able boy is dressed in blue and white in the book. The Nazis knew blue and white were Jewish colors. Do you think this is deliberate in this reading book? And um, from Michelle, 
were those books used in the classroom or were they intended for parents to read to children at home, to the thin? Thank you very much for all these questions, wonderful. Um, I want to start with the first uh, couple of questions by Joe Bork, I think, and I can answer the question of whether there was resistance very um, easily and say that again and again, the special pedagogical community after 45 tried to point out that there were um, educators who tried to teach their students the results to certain tests so that they would not be considered um, uneducable and not be referred out of the help schools. But that was actually only one case that was referred to again and again in different kind of publications. And it happened in one school in Hamburg, but there's no further indication in the files that I've looked at that this is something that was common practice. So we could conclude from that, that it actually, that there wasn't a lot of resistance to that. And then we can look at more kind of the activities of the Fachschaft 5, the chapter 5 of the NSAB, and see that in the Deutsche Dunderschule, the, the journal, the German special school, there were again and again um, publications stating that we demand, we help school teachers demand to be included in the Hered hereditary health commissions that were usually headed by doctors and um, uh, legal advisors to determine whether sterilization should happen or not. And so the special school lobby was one thing to have more power within these courts. And this also came along with a kind of upgrade of the profession by saying that we are educating our special educators along hereditary laws that have this air of, you know, research and science and so our profession is becoming you know uh, similarly influential to that of psychiatrists to that of physicians and so it actually kind of tapped into a sort of need for special educators to develop recognition within the educational discipline as particularly you know, necessary colleagues that were actually in the service of this greater uh, race hygienic doctrine of the state. And so um, another example that I would like to um, raise here is that also special educators were coming up with developing these assessment forms further so that they would actually present more information on the students that was asked uh, by the policies so that they they develop it in order to show kind of how much they are um, how much they are eligible to pass judgment on their students and you, you can see from these examples a kind of a very eager involvement in terms of um, assessment material and you can call it personalbum personal assessment form or you can call it pedagogical assessment form as is used today in inclusive education of students with special needs, but kind of this way of documenting and of, you know, listing the deficits of students and placing them against, you know, the able-bodied norm is something that was extremely moved forward in that, in that time. And that was didactical material that became kind of part of the repertoire of a special pedagogue. Um, so I would say what we do know about these teachers is that they probably um, received some kind of upgrade of their professional feeling or professional belongings due to their like, scientific knowledge base that they were building. Um, another question was uh, 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 the question of um, the, the blue and white colors of yeah. the depiction of the boy. And that's interesting. And thank you so much for pointing that out to me. We should notice that the book was published in 1942. And so by then, Jewish children were already excluded from public education in Nazi Germany. So whether um, the depiction of the boy is kind of is also tapping into anti-Semitic stereotypes and hatred towards um, the racially and disabled other 
is certainly um, a path that I would like to look into and that I cannot give much more evidence to at the moment or support, but I, yeah, I'm fascinating. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we have other children's books where anti-Semitic propaganda is spread um, grossly more, more dominant and more aggressively. So I think there wouldn't have been a lack of that kind of literature available to educators if they wanted to, um, uh, you know, if they wanted to produce more propaganda geared towards um, towards Jewish children. Um, and then the last book, whether so in the end of the book, um, it, it, there's a recommendation printed for how to use this book in in class, and also the NSLB was the institution that that gave its final agreement to all the educational material that was allowed to be used by teachers. So um, this publication was most likely not used um, at home with parents, but actually part of the curriculum. When I go back to the museum, which I hope to, to do soon, I would like to find the list um, um, that, that kind of says that this book was approved and integrated into the canon, which I've not been able to do until, until now. So I'm looking into that direction as well. Thank you very much. Irina. Yes. You have a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, my internet uh, at some point. Uh, uh, which one was? Uh, do you want me to, to read it? You can. Uh, uh, Rami, Rami asked about uh, yeah. if, for Ami, you have a question uh, for Megan. Were, ah, yes, sorry. There, were German students went to Romania or other uh, SE Europe countries? What was the attitude of German students? Were they bringing German uh, superiority to these countries? Yes. Well, I, while I didn't study it itself, this problem in itself, uh, these semi official summer schools that took place uh, in the 30s, in the early 30s, uh, involved also German students coming to Romania, for example. And I found uh, some accounts of these uh, summer schools uh, that were very strongly linked with the legionary movement. And these German students, which were also national socialists like Hitler, Uganda, and so on, they were visiting like uh, legionary summer camps, war camps, and uh, so, so on. Uh, regarding the superiority, I didn't find in the German archives like reports of these German students stating this, but uh, there are some articles uh, regarding, uh, for example, the um, um, trips that the female German students, uh, female students uh, did in Southeastern Europe. And in these articles, uh, it's uh, very clearly stated that uh, they, uh, they felt like they are going to politically educate the German minority in Romania, for example. This is a specific example that I, I know about. So while it's not my field of interest, I found some, uh, definitely some, uh, some hints regarding the German students coming to educate uh, people from Southeastern Europe, including uh, uh, Romania. So we have another question, but I am afraid that uh, we have no time. Yeah. Yes, Daniela, this is what you wrote me. So uh, if anybody Maybe. wants, Maybe just the question of Rami and uh, ah, okay, Ronnie, you want to read it? Uh, so Rami is asking, uh, can you give examples of right-wing policies adopted by communists? I think he's referring to your last comment uh, regarding the Romanian. Yes, I know. So it was. <laughs> so I was uh, referring, uh, especially uh, of course. The, um, the communism in Romania also had traits like anti-Semitism at some point. Of course, it had uh, problems with so some minorities which were never recognized during the communist regime, like the Roma minority, for example. But what I was referring to is uh, when I spoke about uh, recuperating uh, the former far-right intellectuals during the communism, was that uh, after that after the July thesis of uh, 1971 and 
Ceaușescu started to rebuild Romanian history and Romanian culture so that it, it would appear that it was one of the biggest cultures in the world and uh, only, you know, it was very romanticized and so on. But then all, uh, all that those uh, nationalist historians or philosophers uh, wrote during the 30s and 40s fit very well into this kind of discourse. Uh, so, so this is why they were uh, at some point employed in the different institutes of the Romanian Academy to write about Romanian history, for example, because uh, Ceausescu liked the way they wrote about this, or these philosophers that they wrote about the Romanian soul and how exceptional it is and so on, which is, is also a zeitgeist from the interwar. This was very much uh, uh, on the likes, liking of Ceausescu. So he did use this, uh, this intellectuals for his own agenda, so to say. And uh, of course, there is also the fact that many of these intellectuals who used to go to prison in the 50s became informants in the 60s, in the 70s uh, for the Romanian uh, Securitate. So uh, this is a very, very um, uh, sensitive topic because uh, these people also had to survive somehow. Uh, they had to have a job, they had to earn some money, they have to reintegrate in the communist society. So sometimes they even agreed to, uh, for example, give informative notes about their former legionary friends from Romania or even from abroad. Some of them even managed to go abroad for a conference, for a fellowship and so on, because they were expected to do some things there. Uh, not only to write reports, but for example, to convince uh, Emil Cioran, for example, to say something good about communist Romania, <laughs> or, you know? So there, there were propaganda strategies that they were involved. So as I was not speaking about right-wing policies, but the fact that this kind of uh, uh, national vision, nationalist vision, which is specific for the far right, at some point very much passed to, to communist uh, Ceausescu's vision of Romania. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for all the speakers and the participants. Uh, Boaz, you want to add something? Uh. My, my concluding speech is in the next uh, session. I will say that uh, I again, uh, it was an amazing workshop. Thank you to all of you. And we are opening our next workshop in an hour, which gives you time to do whatever you do when your computer is closed. And uh, we will, uh, you are most invited to the last session of our conference uh, in an hour's time. Goodbye, and it was wonderful. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.